This is Think Energy, the podcast that helps you better understand the fast-changing world of energy through conversations with game changers, industry leaders, and influencers. So join me, Dan Sege, as I explore both traditional and unconventional facets of the energy industry. Hey everyone, welcome back. The issue of climate change has resulted in a global mission by governments around the world to set targets in an effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In response, businesses and organizations have been tasked with understanding their own emissions and finding ways to reduce them. But where do businesses begin? Identifying all sources of emissions a business produces can be a daunting task, especially for large organizations with complex operations. Furthermore, collecting, measuring, and analyzing data can be time-consuming and challenging, especially if the data is dispersed across various systems and departments. It requires specialized equipment and expertise. Plus, government regulations can be complex and ever-changing, making it difficult for businesses and organizations to stay up to date with the latest requirements. Finally, there is an issue of cost, where many businesses and organizations may struggle to justify the expense, especially if they operate in a highly competitive industry with narrow profit margins. How do they navigate what funding and rebates are available? So here is today's big question. How can businesses be informed about their own emissions and get on track to become a more competitive and sustainable business in the age of net zero targets? Joining us today is Glenn Mooney, Manager of Energy Services for Invari. Glenn is responsible for business development and programs for a variety of energy management and energy advisory services. Glenn, so great to have you join us today. Now, Glenn, perhaps you can start by telling our listeners about Invari and the type of programs and services the organization provides. Sure. Um, Invari has been around since 2001, so we just celebrated our 20th anniversary last year, kind of the year before during COVID. It wasn't much of a celebration. We formed, we've formed, we've grown out of a what was called Energy Auto. We've rebranded to Invari a few years back, so that's kind of the history of the organization. We've, we've broken it into three practices. We have a lighting practice, an electrical practice, and buildings practice, and we provide pretty much anything to do with buildings energy, not just electricity, but electricity, gas, water, steam, carbon, anything that is a resource or an um, energy-based element. Um, We do on the building side, so I'm responsible for the building side and kind of anything that happens inside them. So we do a lot of systems design for building systems. We do a lot of engineering and audits and assessments and feasibility studies, a lot of green building initiatives. But the one thing we're probably best at is we do a lot of projects. We've probably done well over a thousand energy and sustainability projects from end to end, concept to commissioning, we call it. So HVAC and building automation, ultra efficient heat pumps. We've done a lot of work in that space lately, building automation and controls and doing some really interesting things on the control side. Anything data, energy data, carbon data, uh, doing that, tracking it for our customers and helping to support them with analyzing data and giving them tangible results out of what we find, uh, distributed energy resources. So we, we've we tried to create a, a business that fits in an area that wasn't serviced well, and I think that's served us very well over time. Cool. So Glenn, what are some of the common challenges businesses face when trying to achieve their greenhouse gas emission targets, and how can you help them overcome these challenges? Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing is just where to start. Most people, this is a new world. It's, it's a new world for all of us. It's a big shift and they just need some help, some support. Where am I? How do I start? Where do I need to go? What kind of pathway? Probably an overused term, but it fits for the purpose of chasing carbon. The big thing I guess we can help with is the expertise, but just we've been through it. So we 
end to end again you need support right from the top so you need support from your 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 ceo level your cfo level that's the big challenge because the economics of this is a bit challenging uh the asset management people the operations people is just getting them engaged get the stakeholders engaged There's a lot of money is a big part of this so it's it's managing that managing it versus capital plans those sorts of things so like we as a company or as a group of companies we've kind of taken what our ceo calls a moonshot we were trying to go to net zero by 2030 and it's it's, it's going to be a it's going to be a challenge but hey we're going to do it now glenn can you help me better understand how you typically approach the analysis of the company's energy usage and identify areas where improvements can be made yeah, we start with, we call it an energy balance, which kind of informs a carbon balance. So it's basically take how much energy does the building use? How does it use it? What? How does that convert into carbon or your CO2 emissions or your greenhouse gases, your footprint, whatever you want to call it? And then we start to break it down. There's a lot of intelligence we can get from information, just being in some buildings, understanding how systems work and kind of break down that how is natural gas used in a building? How is electricity used in the building? And then what can you do about the carbon sources like the natural gas? How do you kind of translate those into potential measures that can reduce that footprint? It's tough. The grid, you'll never, it, it's tough to get to a zero because the grid itself is not clean. So even just recently, the Ontario grid is, they used to say it was 93% clean. It's now closer to 90 because we brought on a little bit more carbon generation for a while as there's some refurbishments going on in the nuclear side of things. So it's uh, it's a bit of a challenge to get to zero. There are ways to do it. And that's the, that's the path that we try to find. It also, I just, one thing it kind of brings up is a whole hybrid one. Do you still, do you want the gas meter off the building or are you willing to use gas in really tough times when it's a design, extremely cold day that maybe some of the other services or sources can't totally get you all the heat that you need, say, in a cold, cold winter day? Okay. Now, Glenn, maybe you can give an example of a successful energy efficiency project Invari has implemented for a business that is helping them achieve their greenhouse gas emission targets? Sure. Um, I guess the one that comes to mind is kind of a a large campus, multi-use, multi-function, looking at everything from solar to tons of carbon reduction efforts, looking at their fleet and electric vehicle charging and the infrastructure that goes with it. The biggest thing with a lot of this new shift to less carbon is the impact on the electrical capacity of the facilities or their own network. And then also, how does it impact the utility of the local distribution company like a Hydro Ottawa? Because we're now asking for more electricity to support this. A lot is done in building automation systems. We spend a lot of space there and probably more retro commissioning to try to, the, the best thing to do is lower your load as low as you can first, and then look at other ways of delivering the heating and the cooling to the building. So retro commissioning is one just to let's let's minimize the load first and then start from there. And then the HVAC systems look at what alternatives are there to existing carbon consuming gas um, devices in a building. So that's where that hybrid discussion comes in. And it, I emphasize that because it is a bit of a mind shift for people. They may want to, let's just get that meter off the building. As I said before, we really need to think that decision through because that's got a lot of impact economically when you try to go build your business case for it. I think the biggest thing for them, sorry, Dan, is just to really match it with your your uh, your capital plans. Let's not throw out good equipment right away. And that's a tendency to kind of model things that way. But let's look at, is that boiler due for replacement in, say, 2020 or 2032 or 33? Let's plan on that, unless you've got a more aggressive target. But let's try to match it up with how you're actually going to do your life cycle of your equipment. Now, what role does technology and innovation play in reducing greenhouse gas emissions for businesses? And... How does Invari stay up to date with all of those latest technologies? So we've done, I mentioned it earlier, we've probably built over a thousand projects. So we know what equipment's out there. We're always engaged with the industry, the manufacturing side and the, the vendor side to understand what's out there. But we also go beyond that. We've done quite a few pilots. We did one recently uh, for Natural Resources Canada, where we looked at cold climate heat pumps in real situations. We installed them in actual people's houses and we monitored them, assessed them and figured out what the advantages were and what the economics of it were. And 
one of the big things that came out of it is just the improvement that's happened just even in the last three, four, five years to heat pump technologies, for example. Uh, we're seeing it more on the industrial side. We're, we, we're seeing heat pumps right now that we can get 180 and 190 degree water out of temperatures that were never before able to be brought out of heat pumps. So those are big advances. There's a lot of technology and a lot of R&D going into those areas for different products. And I think we have to be also mindful of the fact that it's going to keep going. So to my example earlier of maybe changing a boiler out in 2020 or sorry, 2033, hard to keep track of time these days. We have to know that there's going to be better technologies then as well. So let's keep some hope for the future. Okay. How do you ensure that businesses stay compliant with government regulations regarding greenhouse gas emissions? So it's, we have a separate uh, practice that we we call Advisor Plus, or I guess a service where we actually help customers track their energy, track their carbon, advise them when there's changes, advise them on how markets are going. Is there any changes? Are the regulation changes? Carbon and commodity pricing of electricity and gas, other elements basically of, of commodity pricing, and just try to give them some good forecasting. We find that there's a lot of, a lot of tools out there available to everybody that's so many uh, sources of information, we try to kind of bring it down to a simple one and we provide that to them rather than them having to go look for it. Okay, I've got a follow-up question here for you, Glenn. Um, how do you measure and track progress towards greenhouse emission reduction targets and what metrics do you use? Yeah, and that's the tools part of it. So we have a we have a couple of really great tools. One of them is a dashboard, and I think it's industry leading. It can it brings in anything you want to bring into it: electricity, gas, water, steam, carbon, and it's got some really good artificial intelligence in it to a help you run a facility and 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 get some good insights into how your facility is running. But it's also that record that shows you how you're doing progress wise year over year, month over month, those sorts of things. The metrics we use. We we tend to standardize on the federal metrics because the, the this is a cross Canada effort that's happening. So uh, I, I will say Enercan is probably the they have a product called Red Screen that they use for their own modeling. So we tend to know that that will be updated as regular, and we've decided as a company that that will be kind of our first level of metric as far as how greenhouse gases are calculated. Okay, now let's talk about affordability. How does a company balance the financial costs of implementing energy efficient projects with the potential cost savings and environmental benefits? So there's a, there's a lot of grants and incentives and programs and offerings out there. Keeping track of it is a challenge where they fit, and where they don't fit, and how long the windows are open for. They come onto the market and then they may be closed. So there's limited time to maybe make an application to some of these. So that's what we help our customers with is here's what's available for your project. Uh, if there's an urgency to it, we get them through that quickly and get them applied and get them hopefully funded for these because these are not great business cases in a lot of times. So those grants are essential to actually driving this forward. It, it's tough sometimes to make business business cases. These are, these are, the reality is, is natural gas is cheaper than electricity right now. Our job is to try to find a way to make it more economically feasible to move to a less carbon intensive source. So that's a challenge. And I mentioned it earlier, getting to that CFO level, educating them on this type of business case, but because it's not the simple energy efficiency, simple payback business case that there used to be, there's longer term play here with longer term implications. So it's, it's getting everybody involved. It's getting shareholders to make a commitment and then educate people from the top to the bottom. Now, Glenn, how do you educate and train businesses on best practices for reducing greenhouse gas emissions? And what role do employee engagement and behavioral change play in this process? Yeah, so it is it is getting that buy-in from the top, the shareholders, and quite often that's where it'll come from. It'll come from a shareholder statement, and then the rest of the organization needs to walk the talk. And the people at the top, the, the, the executive in the organization, need to actually walk that talk and show that they're serious about doing this. The CFO has to understand the economics of it and be prepared to support it. It's it's a lens to this. It's a very These are very precious resources, and it's how they look at it. You've got to kind of create that lens that everything you do in your business needs to be focused on something like this. Our 
our kids will figure it out for us because they're going to tell us when we're offside. So that's what a lot of us are going to bring this home and hear from our own families that what are you guys doing in your business? So I think that's one of the neat pressures. They're probably going to hold our feet to the fire on this one. So it, it's it's a challenge to get everybody to buy in, but I, I think good examples. And as we move down this path, I think we're going to see more and more successes that are going to make it easier for the next company to pick it up and go with it. Okay. Um, how do you ensure that energy efficiency measures are sustainable and can be maintained over the long term? And that's the data part of it is tracking. We do a lot of data acquisition and data analysis with insights, but then we also do a lot of measurement and verification because this is one of the things that will happen as people make commitments to reducing carbon. There's always going to be uh, watchdogs out there watching to make sure that you've lived up to what you said you're going to live up to. So having that measurement and verification by kind of an unbiased or an independent group, uh, which we perform a lot for clients, I think is a big part of that because it's you're going to need to at some point put a stamp on it and say, yes, we saved this bunch carbon. Finally, Glenn, what advice do you have for businesses that are just starting to address their greenhouse gas emissions? And what are some of the most important steps they can take to achieve their targets? I'd say find a friend with knowledge. That's, that's, we all do that. It's, it's, there's a tendency because it's new to try to solve the solution in-house yourself and try to educate yourself and bring yourself up to speed. But I always believe in you surround yourself with smart people and just reach out to the people that have already done it. We do the same. Like we're, we're not all knowing. Nobody knows all of this. Uh, I think we know a really good share of it, but we have some really smart partners around us that will often lean on to provide different components of it that we may not have in-house. But we try to have the best minds in the industry around us to support us when we're dealing with customers. Oh. Okay, Glenn, lastly, we always end our interviews with some rapid fire questions. Sir, are you ready? I am ready. Okay, here we go. What are you reading right now? It's a book called Bear Town. It's about a, a fictitious hockey team, and uh, I won't give it away, but in, a, in another country, you don't really figure that out until halfway through the book. But uh, I played a lot of hockey when I was younger, so I, I kind of relate to this. Good book. Glenn, what would you name your boat if you had one? Or maybe you do. I do not have a boat. Uh, I spent a lot of time in my younger years around uh, friends that race boats. So I spent a lot of time in boat racing. And I guess the one that sticks in my head was a, a boat that was just physically a beautiful boat, very fast. Uh, and it was called Color Me Gone. And that's the name that always stuck with me is that was he, he lived up to his name. Okay. Who is someone that you admire? I'd have to go with my father. My parents were amazing people, but my father and my ex, or not my ex-father-in-law, my father-in-law that just passed away a couple of years ago, actually, during COVID, they were just just very good people. And, and my father-in-law always, his life, uh, the way he lived his life was just be kind to people. And uh, that's one that I've always, I, I saw the impact that it had around people when he passed away there a couple of years ago. He was just known as a very kind, gentle person. Okay, next one here. What is the closest thing to real magic that you've witnessed? I saw David Copperfield live actually at the NAC. And I, wa I can remember walking out that night going, uh, <laughs> I have no idea. It was cool. It was entertaining. But uh, And the other magic I've had in my life personally is I was behind the net for the golden goal in Vancouver at the uh, Olympics. So uh, that's uh, that was a pretty magical moment in another way. Okay, Glenn, what has been the best biggest challenge to you personally since the pandemic began? So one of, the, one of the things I did, and I'm, I guess, a little bit different in COVID is I actually lost weight because I was working at home. I was very dead. I, I needed to lose weight. So I went and did it. The struggle part of that is keeping it off. So kind of change the lifestyle. You creep back. You kind of make adjustments to go back. So not sure I'm winning yet, but I'm trying hard. Okay. Now we've all been watching a lot more Netflix and TV lately. What's your favorite movie or show? So the one I'm hooked on right now is called Louder Milk. I don't think it's Netflix. I think it's a it's a prime one. It's it's just funny. I just sorry, it's my type of humor and I kind of relate to it. It's good. We just finished uh, Daisy Jones and the Six, which I thought was good. Um somebody said last week I never clued into this that it's kind of loosely based on uh the whole drama of Fleetwood Mac. So I was so as soon as somebody said that, I was like, okay, now I get it. So yeah, very good series. Lastly, what's exciting you about the industry right now. 
So I've done this for, I, I did the math the other day, over 30 years that I've been in the energy type business. And I would say that this has just accelerated about tenfold. We've done energy, this whole transition to climate change, carbon reduction. It's just foots all fully down on the on the accelerator for this. It's Things are going to change so much in the next 20 years, probably far more than I've seen in 30 years before now. So I think that's pretty exciting. We have a lot of young engineers here that are just well, A, incredibly smart, but they've got a neat future ahead of them with this. Well, Glenn, this is it. We've reached the end of another episode of the Think Energy podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. If our listeners want to learn more about you, how can they connect? Envari.com. We have a bunch of uh, video stories of kind of the work we've done. And I would say that just go go take a look at our website. I think we've done a really nice job of it. And uh, our comms people have done a great job at just trying to frame the work that we've done. So check it out, Envari.com. Again, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you had a lot of fun. It was great. Thanks, Dan. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of the Think Energy Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you're listening. And to find out more about today's guest or previous episodes, visit thinkenergypodcast.com. I hope you'll join us again next time as we spark even more conversations about the energy of tomorrow.